please welcome to the stage Dr. Shannon French. Good afternoon, everyone. The panel that you're about to hear is going to focus on ethical, legal, and societal issues. Autonomous systems that integrate advanced perception with sophisticated reasoning offer great promise for national defense, embracing security and peacetime operations. Our speakers today are Dr. Ron Arkin, who is the professor and director of the Mobile Robot Lab at Georgia Tech, right here, and Ms. Diane Saheli, who is responsible AI's division of its new Chief Digital and AI Office, or CDIO. Thought you needed some more acronyms there. <laughs> Let me briefly tell you a little bit about your panelists. Ron Arkin is Regents Professor and Director of the Mobile Robot Laboratory in the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. He served as Stint Visiting Professor at KTH in Stockholm, sabbatical chair at the Sony IDL in Tokyo, member of the Robotics and AI Group at LAAS CNRS in Toulouse, and in Brisbane, Australia at Queensland University of Technology and CSIRO. His books include Behavior-Based Robotics, Robot Colonies, and Governing Lethal Behavior in Autonomous Robots. He has provided expert testimony to the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the Pentagon and others on autonomous systems technologies. Professor Arkin served on the Board of Governors of the IEEE Society on Social Implications of Technology and on their Robotics and Automation Society, ADCOM, and is a founding co-chair of IEEE's RAS Technical Committee on Robot Ethics. He served as a distinguished lecturer for the IEE Society on Social Implications of Technology and is also a fellow with them. Our second speaker is the Chief of Responsible AI, Digital and AI Office for the Department of Defense. Before taking this role, Diane was an assistant group leader of the Artificial Intelligence Technology Group at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, where she leads efforts related to human-centered AI. Her interest areas include human AI interaction, explainable AI, decision science, autonomy, socio-technical systems, and user-centered design. Saheli has worked within multiple groups and mission areas across the laboratory and has led research in diverse areas, such as cybersecurity, intelligence, influence operations, and serious gaming. She is involved externally with the government and academic research communities related to visualization and human factors, including the IEEE Visualization Conference and the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society. Prior to joining the laboratory, she worked in industry for 12 years at a variety of technological companies, ranging from home networking startups to global cybersecurity. And she holds an MA degree in software engineering from Harvard and an MS degree in human factors. Now to start us off, I'm going to use the moderator's privilege of asking initial questions to each of our speakers and seeing what conversation that uh, sparks up. But we will be opening up to questions from the audience. So I encourage you to have that virtual platform open and ready to go so that you can feed us your questions as they occur. My first question is to you, Ron. There are several autonomous systems that are being funded, explored, or contemplated by DARPA. We've obviously heard about a lot of them at this conference. And they reflect significant advancements in technology, such as machine learning and even artificial intelligence. However, the idea of autonomous systems gives some pause, raising concerns about the ethical, legal, and societal implications of allowing non-human systems to make decisions that affect human lives. These implications are especially significant when the stakes are life and death, as is often the case with military decision making. What, if any, worries do you have about the use of autonomous systems for military decision making? Might there be actual benefits to taking some military decision making out of human hands? Thank you, Shannon. Um, first, I'd like to Thank DARPA for inviting me uh, to serve on this panel. 
I think it's a crucially important topic, and I hope to have a fertile engagement with the uh, audience. But let me address the question uh, specifically. Are there concerns? Well, you saw I served in Toulouse uh, for a year um, on sabbatical. And for those of you who are students of military history, forgive me, uh, but I am uh, going to probably say some things that warrant correction, especially from the original Latin. Uh, but uh, do uh, correct me tomorrow, not today. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Albigensian Crusade, you know, was launched by the King of France uh, and the Pope against the Cathars, which were centered in Toulouse and northern Italy and Spain. And they uh, were viewed as a heresy uh, to the Vatican. And as such, they sent armies down there to deal with the problem. One of the first things in about 800 years ago uh, that they addressed uh, was a town in the south of France called Béziers. Uh, and what they did was they had a siege of it. And eventually, uh, Simon de Montfort, who led the uh, uh, siege, from a military perspective, uh, broke in, and all the Catholics and the Cathars all gathered into the church. They gathered into the church and barricaded themselves inside. And so the Vatican, uh, uh, the Simon de Montfort said, what should we do to the Vatican prelate who was there? And uh, the quote, loosely translated from the Latin, or incorrectly translated from the Latin, which you've probably heard before, is kill them all, God will sort them out. Now, keep in mind, that's an easy algorithm to implement, but probably not a morally acceptable one, at least in this uh, day and age. So we can do better. And then let me jump to only, oh, 160 years ago, here in Atlanta, where Sherman uh, actually uh, was considering uh, uh, destroying and actually wasn't considering, was destroying not so much targeting civilians as was the case before, but certainly civilian infrastructure uh, in his uh, burning of Atlanta and his march uh, to the sea. Uh, that's another example, perhaps, uh, of first example, maybe, it's debatable, of total warfare. Uh, but that's not what we as a nation uh, do anymore, uh, and nor should we. So. What can we do about that? How can we do better, certainly than those uh, examples, but better than some of the examples that we are seeing uh, right now? And we have to be concerned with new technology as it's emerging and potentially outpacing our ability to regulate it. We have to be concerned with that and find ways to address that. And in some cases, that will require research. Um, I will speak later if anyone has a question about what particular research points are probably the best to deal specifically with lethal autonomous weapon systems, which I've spoken to the UN, the ICRC, and other places, numerous other places uh, over time, uh, and perhaps what we can do to ensure that we proceed with due caution at the very least and not rush unproven technology from an ethical or moral perspective to the battlefield, despite perhaps pressures uh, to do so. And is there any, uh, any benefits? Well, I argue somewhat controversially that perhaps there are. I view those systems and I believe that they are inevitable because one, I believe wars will continue, uh, unfortunately, and I believe that they've already been fielded, uh, perhaps not in the envisioned AI sense, but certainly with intelligent landmines, the phalanx system on Aegis-class cruisers, and a variety of other systems as well, too. Uh, all of those are examples, of my mind, of systems that at some level are human-controlled, but still are making life-or-death decisions uh, at the end. So can we do better? And perhaps if we view these systems as a new generation, perhaps a revolutionary generation of precision-guided munitions, which can better protect civilians and better protect civilian infrastructure, then perhaps we are serving the principles of our nation uh, and not only winning wars. So I just am here to perhaps remind us of that, and I'll be glad to uh, speak further to it as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, let's go to Diane now. Um, 
How do we make sure that the ethics side of R&D, some of the issues that Ron raised or other issues that arise depending on the field of work, not to mention the full slate of LC considerations, so ethical, legal, societal, isn't a burden to engineers and designers. Can you help us better understand how it might be possible to actually use ethical constraints as moments for innovation? How seeming limitations could create new opportunities? Thanks, Shannon. Um, so to provide a little bit of context for the folks in the audience who might not be familiar with our office, the, the mission of CDAO is to accelerate adoption of artificial intelligence across the department. And part of my job is to build the capability for the department for responsible AI, uh, which includes tools as well as people, um, providing both the technical capabilities, the processes, the best practice, the guidance, uh, as well as the education and training for the workforce. Um, to be able to, to um, move forward in this area. So I've spent a lot of time since I've been in my job to uh, understand, to work with our capability development teams to understand what are the barriers to adoption. Um, and some of the, the sort of cultural fears that I've heard have been the fear that we are going to and shut down a program because it's not going to follow the guidelines or um, that we're going to tell someone in a war fighting situation that they can't use that capability because it isn't responsible. Um, so the, in having some of those conversations, what I've learned is that we need to be able to build responsible AI practices into our development processes that are already being done. Um, one of our um, core, the core tenets of our philosophy is that we want to be able to build quality products and be technologically mature in our AI offerings. And so we want to be following those best practices anyway. Um, so we need to build out the checklists uh, so that it can be democratic, right? Every capability developer has a role in being responsible. It's just not me and my immediate team. Uh, so we have to give those people the tools that they need to be able to do that and bake that in. Uh, the other piece of that is to, to the other part of your question, Shannon, uh, is about the innovation side. So we have seen examples in the commercial world uh, where regulation and constraint actually gives you an opportunity to innovate and come up with new solutions uh, that help uh, work around that constraint. A good example is uh, the field of electric cars. So there was an article in The New Yorker that came out uh, a few months ago talking about uh, the, there was a, a law passed by Congress where they put out a law that said you know, electric cars are so quiet, pedestrians are getting hurt. Uh, every electric vehicle has to make a sound if it's traveling under a certain number of miles per hour. Um, and the auto industry really responded to that and now is hiring high-end sound designers and thinking about sound systems for, for these electric vehicles. Um, so they've actually turned this, this regulation and this policy into a moment of innovation. Um, and th that becomes a distinguishing feature for their commercial offering. Um, so we want to be able to, in our programs, build in those moments uh, where we can ideate around those problem spaces and bring some of that user-centered design into the process um, so that we're not just checking a box, but we're actually coming up with technical innovations as well. That's a wonderful example. And certainly also uh, to your earlier comments, as an ethicist, I'm delighted <laughs> to hear you talking about baking things in early instead of the... Uh, the notion of leaving the ethical concerns or the review of that to the end and then it's so much harder to, to um, add things in or fix things at that point. That's very encouraging, er, early, often, and always. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'd like to follow up first with, uh, with you, Ron, on something you said and then we're gonna jump back and forth just a little bit uh, and then, as I said, take some questions from the audience. But, you know, Ron, when you were talking about autonomous systems, and obviously you've done so much work internationally around these issues, I'm sure you've encountered the argument that certain decisions are so significant in terms of the consequences that there ought to be a human in the loop for those decisions, not necessarily because we think humans would do better, but so that there's someone to be held accountable and there's someone to hold the moral weight of those decisions. I wonder if you could speak to this. Are there other ways to achieve meaningful accountability? Good question. Um, certainly a human 
must be responsible for these actions at some particular level. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. The question is, where is that influence? Whether, and let's talk about the phrase in the loop, which comes from the OODA loop that you probably are familiar with out there. Um, maybe it's time to update that thinking because it's moved to on the loop and you know, <laughs> outside the loop and all sorts of other things as well too uh, over time. Uh, but we need to find ways to engineer responsibility into the deployment of these systems. Mm -hmm. Because when things go wrong, it's, you cannot say it's the machine's fault, mm -hmm. okay? That's just wrong. Uh, you can't say if you shoot a gun uh, with somebody that it's the gun's fault. It just doesn't work that way. The technology is getting advanced sufficiently and you have to be able to apply either to the last person in the kill chain who deployed it, which is unfortunately often the scapegoat for these things. If you think about the Patriot missile system and the like as well too, mm -hmm. where they have, I don't know, nine seconds, I think, to mm -hmm. hit a red light to stop it. Uh, what kind of deliberation can be done by that person? What kind of information can be used to uh, effectively uh, make a decision to halt uh, that system? And anecdotally, uh, in Kuwait, uh, I believe that button was never pushed. Uh, mm. um, and why would they? Because the choice is either potentially shoot down something that may be an enemy or allow missiles to come in and hit your friendlies uh, as well. There's just not enough, but they would be at fault, I suspect, uh, and that's often the case in the kill chain. But we have to re-examine that. It's the people that design these systems. It's the people that are in the command structure, yes, the command structure, that deploy these systems. It's even the developers of these systems and the industrialists that create them. Uh, where you find that responsibility and what laws are invoked, whether it's in uh, civil laws or torts or uh, international uh, crime uh, in, in The Hague uh, may vary, but unfortunately that policy does not really exist. And it would be great if we could improve upon assigning that. One of the, so we built software, a prototype proof of concept software, which had ethical components built into it, which I'm not going to talk about here, in the work we did for ONR, well, uh, maybe 15 years ago, uh, that had a responsibility advisor. Uh, in it as well too, which made sure that the operator who was using that system was appropriately trained. And in some cases, it required a two key kind of system as well too, that two people would have to sign off before the deployment. Those are the sorts of things uh, that I think could potentially help. Well, that's very helpful. And I would also add that uh, having worked in military ethics for over 25 years now, one of the things that happens is whenever a new technology comes out, you hear people say, oh, we must need to now rewrite just war theory, the just war tradition. We need all new principles of just war. And that's almost never true. What we need is what you were describing. In fact, I would assert it's never true. <laughs> Instead, what has to happen is the hard work, and it is difficult, but can be done, of taking those principles that exist that have been time tested like principles of distinction, who is a legitimate target, who isn't, all uh, principles of proportionality, and figuring out how do they work with this new technology. And that's the kind of policy that has to be written in time with this technology being developed. Very important work. Jumping back for a moment um, to you, Diane, I'm wondering if you could describe for us what you see as the optimal relationship between LC consultants and industry. Uh, you spoke of making sure to bake things in and not stick them just at, in the end. How specifically can we avoid having a check in the box uh, attitude where just lip service is played to ethical concerns? So I think I will take a, a bit of a broader perspective and mm -hmm. talk about just relationship with industry more broadly, yeah. if that's okay. Um, so one of the activities that my office is engaging in is um, trying to better understand um, how we can bake ethical concerns and responsible concerns into the acquisition process. We know that's an area that we have to work on. So uh, one, of the, one of the documents that my office has issued over the last year is our Responsible AI Strategy and Implementation Pathway document. Uh, it's available on our website at ai.mil. Um, it's public, everyone can, can go and take a look at it. And it defines 60 different lines of effort um, that are the steps in our strategic plan and our implementation plan for how we are going to address these concerns in the department. And several of those lines of effort have to do with acquisition. 
Uh, one of them is related towards developing an acquisition toolkit, um, which will include things like contracting language that we will bake into contracts with our vendors um, that will specify uh, how or what our expectations are, what our guidelines are um, for that vendor um, to be able to ensure that we have the visibility and auditability that we need into those capabilities that we acquire um, and address some of the intellectual property concerns as well um, to make sure that industry intellectual property is protected. Uh, the other aspect to this is uh, making sure that we foster the pipeline and the ecosystem um, all the way from academia to industry. So what we, we know that many of the innovations will be coming from academia, maybe via places like DARPA. And then those capabilities will be commercialized by various companies. Uh, Dr. Leahy mentioned earlier that we're nurturing new industries, and we're certainly nurturing new industries when we're thinking about ethical regulation as well. So we want to make sure that we're seeding the academic community with those ethical problems, mm -hmm. um, and then those innovations can make their way to industry for us to acquire and for us to be able to um, use those services. Now, I, I appreciate that. And one of the things that uh, I've certainly heard again come up in LC conversations is that it's a mistake for people to assume that the kinds of, let's call them errors or you know, mistakes that, that do have to require some later fix are often the result of some kind of malice or some kind of... Um, actual bigotry or something on the part of some designer along the way, when far more often it's rather that the right questions weren't asked at the right moment, and had they been, then the designers and the engineers would immediately have said, oh, yes, we have to fix that. I mean, one of the classic examples, um, almost become a bit cliche at this point, was when the design of a soap dispenser, uh, no one caught the fact that it was calibrated for white skin. So when someone with anything other than, than uh, white skin tried to put their hand under the soap dispenser, it didn't dispense soap. And it wasn't that everybody who worked on that project was racist, it's that no one thought about that because the people maybe weren't in the room to ask the right questions. So that to me is an interesting element of this as well, that the conversations have to be broad and they have to be diverse. I wonder if we could uh, look at both sides of the picture in a way. What, what do we need to see from not just industry, but also DARPA to get meaningful engagement with ethical issues as new technology emerges? Is, is it the same thing that you were describing, that it needs to go all the way back to training people as they go through their education to be future PMs at DARPA with ethics in mind? So I would say for this question, one of the most important things that we can do, and again, it was touched on earlier today as well, um, is making sure that some of those failures get turned into lessons learned. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that when there are failures or when these things happen, that we can document them, we can figure out what went wrong, and then we know what we need to do for the next iteration. Mm -hmm. um, and making sure that those lessons learned um, just don't stay within your immediate community, but also can be shared more broadly uh, with the academic community, with industry, um, so that there is a community that's working on these kinds of problems. That makes sense, and I, I like that description too, the community working on it together. Mm -hmm. Ron, please follow up. Yeah, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about my history in this context as well too. I started out as a roboticist about 35 years ago, I guess, um, and it was all curiosity-driven research. Mm. And what more, <laughs> DARPA is very heavily curiosity-driven research, especially you pose wonderful DARPA hard problems to people. I've had multiple DARPA programs, most re recently second place in the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. Uh, so I'm still a hardcore roboticist on top of uh, all this. Um, but I didn't start thinking about the consequences until we asked ourselves, what happens if we succeed? What if we succeed? You should be asking that when you're posing your questions and your projects and your PM things as well too. If you succeed, what are the societal, the military, the governmental, and the uh, personal uh, impacts upon you if you succeed in the development of this? That's what launched me into the ethical space, uh, the robot ethical space uh, that I'm in right now as well too. Because I started to see in this journey over my career, which I'll be retiring from uh, at the end of this calendar year, um, 
it was interesting to see that we were succeeding. We were making massive progress, and the technology was escaping out of our ivory tower laboratories into the real world. <laughs> That's scary. And if you don't think about it before, as you were saying, you might find yourself uh, regretting it later uh, in life. There's a principle called the precautionary principle, which is uh, popular in Europe, which talks about emerging technologies and trying to wait until some of the science is done before you let it bleed out into the uh, uh, general population, I guess is the west, best way to describe it. Uh, it's something I think that is almost a required uh, in European proposals that you put a statement regarding, uh, the, at least some of them, uh, the precautionary principle, how it, you've considered that in your proposal. Maybe DARPA should consider something similar. I don't know if you have that now. I haven't written a proposal for some time. Uh, but you should, uh, I would contend. And <laughs> I, I speak that from years of experience. I'm not a novice in this space. So please, uh, consider that. You know, there's a lot of push with, of course, with emerging technology to always be first. But I kind of like the old expression, the second mouse gets the cheese. You think about that for a second. <laughs> what, what happened to the first mouse? Yeah, you got it. Uh, <laughs> but the point there is that it's not always uh, the smartest thing to launch something first when in fact it might be better to let someone else launch it, see what its weaknesses are, and then develop from there. It depends on the circumstance. Uh, this one I think might be uh, to you, Diane. It's an audience question that we've received. How do you deal with the cultural fear that AI systems may potentially transform the DOD workplace to an extent that will lead to the loss of jobs? So we heard from the general earlier that mm -hmm. we don't have enough people to do the jobs that we have already. <laughs> so, uh, it, but I, I recognize that the, the cultural fears are, are very real and I would expect that um, as AI systems are gradually introduced, um, it, it will change the nature of work. And especially in a DOD context, it isn't necessarily going to lead to a loss of a job, but it will change what that job looks like. Um, in many of the jobs within the DOD, uh, cybersecurity is one example, there's a potentially infinite work queue. Um, mm. So AI may take some of those more uh, tedious kinds of tasks uh, and improve someone's ability to complete them, but there are always more tasks to be done um, that would require that human creativity. Um, so the onus is on us to make sure that we are recognizing when that shift is occurring and train up our workforce appropriately um, to be able to use these new systems in, in the ways that they're intended. Ron, I, as someone who's worked so long in robotics, you must get this question too. Uh, we do, uh, <laughs> uh, seriously. Uh, but it's not, it's not only robotics, obviously. Uh, it's almost everywhere in advances in artificial intelligence. Uh, I've taught a course uh, for many years now, Robots in Society, and one of the topics we talk about uh, is potential job loss. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's most important in educating our young workforce is to, I tell them that what you're learning here now, you're not gonna need 15 years from now. It's not gonna hold up any longer. Uh, you'll, you, what we're teaching you is learning how to learn. Lifelong learning is crucially important, not necessarily the lifelong learning program of many years ago that DARPA had, which was an interesting animal. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, how to learn and adapt and change and be agile uh, to move as the environment around you move uh, is something that is dealing with the workforce uh, as well too. And people don't hold the same job. Uh, I asked for a show of hands, uh, but I can't see you, so. <laughs> Uh, but uh, how many people have the same job? I was a chemist many years ago, just to give you a perspective. So people change careers. And in many ways, that's a good thing. It can work to your advantage. But you can also change jobs, move up, move down, move sideways. Um, be, learn to be agile is the key thing I would encourage people to do. And that would help their fears. And if they think what they learned today is going to hold 30, 40 years from now, good luck. I, I like, I'd like to come yeah, in go ahead. on this question yeah. as well, if I could. Um, so we, we do also have evidence that humans are imperfect decision makers. You know, if someone is tired or under stress, uh, their decision making can change. So what we need to be able to do is to take the best of what a human can do in decision making, which would be understanding the context versus 
the, taking what's best about an AI system that can make decisions which may be um, accuracy or space of the decisions that it could consider um, and use this human machine teaming approach to be able to result in combined systems that are better at decision making than just the human or just the AI alone. I'm not sure you read that question yet. I haven't, not yet, but, okay. but um, let me just say to, to your point, Diane, and how well it follows on what Ron was saying about agility and so forth, this idea I think is very appealing that what is being contemplated isn't replacing people, but again, augmenting them and working in this, this uh, team environment where the machines don't take over, which is everyone's sci-fi uh, fear, uh, but instead the machines are freeing up time, which is something that was mentioned, but also helping us do what we're actually already trying to do, maybe a little bit better, but not taking us out. That's, that's intriguing. I'm actually going to go ahead and add this question in because it fits so well with what we're discussing. So another way to frame this with the ethical issues in mind is to say that we know ethical decision making is extremely difficult even for people who are trained in ethical theory. Is there any reason to suppose, or maybe we want to hope that this could be true, that AI could eventually be better at it than humans and why or why not? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Uh, you get to be my age, you're full of anecdotes, so I got an anecdote uh, <laughs> for you. Uh, I, I'm a computer scientist and roboticist by training, but you can see I verged into the philosophy realm. And I went to my first philosophy conference, uh, and I was really frightened, because uh, uh, philosophers have a, uh, uh, a background, I guess, or a legend of them eating their young, uh, and I felt kind of young uh, in that audience. But I, I gave my paper, uh, and it was well received. Years later now, they're writing papers in response to Arkin, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I've, they're eating me now, but not in the first time. But I went to a dinner with a bunch of ethicists, and I sat down at the table. And no, it wasn't the dining philosopher's problem, that, uh, if you're a computer scientist. But uh, it was uh, rather, I asked them, are ethicists more ethical than uh, other people? And they said, Absolutely not. We know what we're doing is wrong. Uh, and so I took that away as an interesting lesson. But now moving to the second part, could they eventually be better at it than humans? Well, in some cases they already are. Um, uh, but I believe that they could do better, especially, and let's talk about laws, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems, if I didn't divide those, in the use of specialized missions. They should be restricted for potential use and never I, I could see them envision as replacing the uh, regular warfighter. A human presence must be kept uh, in the battle space because war is horrible and humanity needs to understand and know that and not just be on the outside looking uh, in. So specialized missions such as demilitarized zones, counter sniper, room clearing operations, only used in, the, at least in the near term, maybe the long term in interstate warfare, not in counterinsurgency operations where there's a high preponderance of civilians. They should be alongside soldiers, as you were mentioning, and not as replacements. Um, and uh, these are the kinds of things where I do believe they could be restrained in their mission to be able to function better uh, than humans. Uh, but uh, AI already does better uh, in logistics and other things as well, conceivably. So. I believe this is a, uh, another question maybe from our audience, and it follows again on what we were just discussing. Do you think weapons that select targets quickly are more acceptable that one, than ones that take longer or indefinite periods of time to do so, like mines? And of course, we know landmines have been banned in some places, but the U.S. hasn't banned them. Ron, would you care to comment on that? Sure. Well, Landmines, anti-personnel mines mm -hmm. have been by, except China, Russia, the United States. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, the United States, let me correct that. They have prohibited their use. I, I believe they're still used for training purposes and in the DMZ. In the DMZ I, in Korea, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but they did not, they're not signers of the Ottawa Accords, uh, yep. uh, is the thing. Um, do we, I don't think the, the time to make the decision is the most appropriate thing. Uh, I think the outcomes. Uh, I tend to be a consequentialist. Uh, I think you said, uh, or uh, our colleague inside said he's a Kantian. Uh, <laughs> there's different perspectives on this as well, too. I, I argue often that if they can be shown somehow to perform more effectively than either existing technology that you have here, 
uh, or than human warfighters in the battlefield, not only may they be appropriate to use, there may be a moral imperative to exist. Human Rights Watch has already stated that with the use of precision guided bombs in urban settings. They said if they are in your armamentarium, you have a responsibility to use them as opposed to dumb bombs. And you saw the effects of that in Syria, uh, for example. I believe these systems can, in these limited, narrow circumstances, do better. Now, if people take them out of those circumstances and use them in different ways, which unfortunately warfighters often do, or in some cases in creative ways, which may not verge outside uh, IHL, international humanitarian law, um, then people have to be held uh, responsible for that. And one of the research areas that I would contend that DARPA should invest in is benchmarks, metrics, evaluation strategies, effective ones uh, for uh, the evaluation of any of these programs that are related uh, with ethical uh, reasoning and ethical, require ethical assessment of the outcomes. And to go back to your earlier point, I think uh, the uh, current state of Russia's illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine has shown us all that the whole kill them all and let God sort them out plan is not in fact even strategically effective, let alone ethically. I'm actually gonna hop back um, briefly to you, Diane, because there's something we didn't get to talk about that, that I'm interested in your views on, and that is bias. Uh, we know that there's a lot of concern about bias in systems, whether it comes from biased data sets or uh, the automation bias that comes from people being too quick to follow what a system says or an automation says over their own instincts. Uh, what do you think is being done or should be done uh, around the bias issue? Yeah, so, so certainly understanding where those sources of bias are is a good first step. So we know that uh, data is one place where a significant, is a significant source or a significant area where bias can be introduced. Um, but there are also biases that can be introduced uh, in the design time, uh, in the development of the algorithms, uh, in the deployment of the systems and the use of the systems as well. Um, so making sure that we understand all of the places uh, in the development process um, is one step. Um, second, and m much of this is being done already today uh, in research as well as in, in my office, um, is being able to have the inspection tools to look into the system and understand um, what is happening in terms of bias. Mm -hmm. um, so that you have, and I would agree with Ron, we need better tools, better metrics, <laughs> uh, better test capabilities um, to understand uh, what to understand and characterize as well as eventually get to the point where we have benchmarks um, so that you know what your system is doing. You know you have a point of comparison between your algorithms. You have a way to look at that data set and understand the characteristics of it mm -hmm. and being able to do that in a repeatable manner. So getting away from that black box idea. Getting away from the black box. Marvelous. Did you want to add something, wrong? I do, because this is an important uh, question. Uh, oh, and you want to ask that one? or I want to answer that one. Did Can I ask it first? Oh, I didn't answer it. I haven't asked okay, that sorry. one. Sorry. Um, That's a good one. <laughs> it, it's a good one. It was looming at him. He saw it there. This is another audience question, and I agree, it is a good one. If you had a few minutes with our senior leaders, what would you suggest as a first step in addressing the funding gaps related to the ethical considerations of AI? Go for it, Ron. Sure. Uh, by the way, I do work in other aspects of ethical uh, intelligence as well, too. Work for the National Science Foundation yeah. uh, in uh, folk morality versus expert morality in uh, human-robot interaction and pill sorting and game playing tasks. Uh, also do a lot of work with was funding under ONR for deception for over 10 years uh, as well. But let me speak specifically to uh, the issues that DARPA is confronting with uh, weapon systems. New tactics need to be developed. Uh, you should find out ways to use those with a goal of reducing harm. The harm done to non-combatants is unconscionable, unacceptable, and should be addressed by funding agencies, and finding ways to use artificial intelligence to do that is crucially uh, important. Like I said, it's not just about winning wars, it's about uh, adhering to IHL and going perhaps beyond and better protecting uh, civilians. Uh, another aspect is recognizing those that are hors de combat, uh, those who have surrendered 
uh, and it's up the responsibility of the individual surrendering to signify that they are surrendering. That may require new signals for surrendering to intelligent perception systems, uh, and also recognizing those that are wounded. Fully automated discrimination between combatants and non-combatants. The URSA program has addressed that to some degree. Uh, evaluation in force-on-force -force exercises or something like that would be the next step uh, for those kinds of things, although that wasn't intended for that particular uh, kind of operation. Proportionality optimization, making sure that the system is using the right level of force given the military necessity. Planning in the presence of moral constraints. Uh, and uh, lastly, operator uh, advisory systems. Uh, I'm going to give this to Shannon uh, because I would like a robot to do what that lieutenant did uh, for the military thing. Could you, would you mind restating the, uh, uh, the story I use about the soldier? No, oh, the, um, the Marines don't do that? Yes. Please. Yes, yeah. This is from um, Mark Ociel's book, Obeying Orders, and it's a true story from the Vietnam War that uh, I and others used to truly illustrate how simple but profound a few words can be. And basically, the situation is just that a very exhausted and uh, frazzled young Marine, uh, having seen a lot of his friends killed and so forth, finds himself uh, facing a woman, a villager, and uh, he draws his gun on her and he is intending to shoot her. And in, it, we've had a chance to talk to uh, the people involved and get what was in their heads, so it's not all speculation. And what he felt at the time was basically that the rules just didn't matter anymore, that, that nothing really mattered anymore, and he was just in a lot of anger and pain. And at that moment, his lieutenant, who wasn't that much older than him, we're talking a difference of about 19 and 26, uh, came upon the scene and found you know, his young, his young uh, recruit with the gun to this woman and um, had seconds to try to stop the situation, and he did it with four words. He said... Marines don't do that. And the reason that worked is, again, incredibly profound. It worked because it snapped that recruit back to an identity that he'd chosen that he did care about. And it only worked because he believed it was true that there were things that Marines don't do. And so to the point that we come to erode those rules or make those lines too blurry, we actually make it harder because the coda to that story is that when they met later, uh, these two men were, were very, very warm in reunion and the younger man thanked the older one for saving him, not saving his life, but saving him from becoming a monster, saving his soul in effect. Yeah, there are two casualties in these uh, things as well too. Yes. The individual that is uh, killed and the individual that does the immoral killing uh, in this particular case. Mm -hmm. And I would love uh, to be able to see funding for an AI program that could create real-time advisory systems through the helmet or whatever to say those sorts of things, recognizing again that there is potential uh, for uh, intervening if, uh, if, if it's the wrong thing to do, uh, having spoken to uh, 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 war fighters that have been in uh, similar circumstances but introduce a moment of doubt which may cause them to not kill when they should kill under those cases. So mm. it's a tough problem. Let's start a heart. It absolutely. Can I also yeah, I can, go ahead. I can take a few minutes and just to talk a little bit about a few of the things that we are trying to do mm -hmm. um, to help foster the ecosystem of, of research in, in this area. Um, so one, I'll return to our strategy and implementation pathway document. Uh, we do have a line of effort in there to work with research and engineering to identify what are the research gaps that funding needs to be applied against. Um, so I'm curious to hear from folks in the room if you're working in this area or your ideas on this. Uh, please catch me afterwards and we can chat. Um, the other line of effort that we have is to uh, foster some of this academic engagement and we'll be working on um, figure out the right mechanisms to do that. Um, so again, having this research agenda in place um, is a good starting place so that we know what the end state is that we're working towards. I'm so happy to have the conversation with folks offline about that. It's very helpful. Uh, we are almost out of time, so I'm just gonna allow, would e each of you like a, a 30 second last comment? Sure. Uh, my motivation, and I hope yours as well too, is to reduce unnecessary casualties. The status quo is woefully unacceptable. 
artificial intelligence, robotics can, should, and must uh, contribute uh, to a lowering of the uh, casualty rates we're seeing in Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, uh, it happens all too uh, often. Uh, and I've often argued that a moratorium is more apropos than a ban. I am not on board with a ban. And I am not a proponent of this technology, strangely enough. Uh, people keep calling me a proponent because I don't agree with the ban. I don't believe I would love it if this technology is never, ever used. But uh, if it is, we need to find ways to make sure it complies with international humanitarian law and moral guidelines. Thank you, Ron. Diane. Yes, so my, my office is dedicated to ensuring that all of the technology that we develop in the Department of Defense adheres to our ethical principles. Um, so I would encourage you all to take a look at the materials that we have put out there. Um, and we, we know that this is a team sport. We know that everyone in, de in the department, um, as well as academia and industry, has a role to play. Um, and looking forward to, to working with all of you on that. If you'll please join me in thanking our excellent panelists.